Soren Kierkegaard in his life and literature by Adolf Holt published in 1906 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org soren kierkegaard in his life and literature on the eleventh of last november fifty years had passed away since the oddest and most complex genius in denmark's literary and religious history fell asleep in copenhagen his birthplace at the frederick hospital after a final illness of a month or more unfriended almost with little to cheer him but the kind nurse the spray of flowers he so much loved and the triumphant certainty of his christian hope his birth centenary comes the fifth of may nineteen thirteen forty-two and one-half years of perhaps the intensest kind of mental life recorded in his country's annals and many another for that matter was all this gigantic intellect needed for the inauguration of a deeply conceived intellectual and religious awakening and for producing a literature amazing as to size content and purpose copenhagen the little paris of the north had even then long enough been stung by this buzzing bee that busily gathered honey for the national hive but instantaneously turned on any interfering object athens was no more troubled by her profoundly busy-bodying socrates than copenhagen by her recluse agitator kierkegaard the most splendid christian counterpart to the quaint ironic philosopher of greece socrates walked the streets idled on the market-places lounged about everywhere on deep ethical missions the university bred kierkegaard shut himself up in his elegant suite of rooms pacing to and fro and ever and anon pausing to jot down his flash-like thoughts only occasionally delivering religious addresses in the churches and again went about incognito to converse with people in public parks or elsewhere both socrates and kierkegaard sought by the subtle pedagogy of philosophic irony to regenerate their respective ages kierkegaard however in the service of christianity had not kierkegaard inherited from his venerable father who was a manufacturer and grocery merchant a goodly estate his life as a retired man of thought and letters would have shaped itself far differently though a son of his father's old age he was fifty-seven at soren's birth and by his father's second wife a former housekeeper the father lived till soren was twenty-five and the melancholy brooding dialectical serious and churchly old man left his son not merely a mental inheritance and the ineffaceable impress of his original sharp-cut personality he left him also from an astute business career the means of an independent manner of living strange to say it lasted just long enough to give soren a debt-free funeral for it must be noted that the bachelor soren who maintained his own rather splendid household with the help of a manservant by degrees consumed his estate in costly literary ventures nobly indifferent to pecuniary reward when his pedagogical program demanded sacrifices his brother peter much unlike soren in nature and later his ecclesiastical opponent used his means to goodly worldly advantage rose to honors even becoming bishop in the state church socrates ended in prison with a cup of hemlock kierkegaard at a hospital in physical agonies and quaffing the gall of scorn and rejection freely invited by himself like ibsen's brand men of one passionate purpose generally tear down the structure of their own prosperity while hoarding treasures for succeeding ages in view of the enormous seemingly inexhaustible intellectual vitality of kierkegaard 
we might be prone to deplore that his tall gaunt fragile form no longer could endure the unnatural strain put upon it by the sleepless mind and unsubdued will until we carefully review his complex career so enigmatic so mysterious and crammed with acute problems yet steadily moving on by conscious determination toward an unavoidable dramatic climax that in the days of torquemada and bloody elba would have meant a sure martyrdom at the stake brandes the agnostic literary savant at the university of copenhagen regards his death as untimely footnote soren kierkegaard eighteen seventy seven page two hundred and sixty seven End footnote. but i incline to the words of his best biographer the profound professor of theology and pulpit orator waldemar rudin of upsala kierkegaard died at the right moment footnote soren kierkegaard eighteen seventy seven page three hundred and twenty nine and footnote evidence in support of this statement will be presented more satisfactorily by a review of his life and literature with the view of ascertaining what the central purpose of kierkegaard's career was to my knowledge no attempt has been made in america to place this unique personality before the english-speaking world apart from the one-sided sketches in martinson's christian ethics and notices in the forthcoming translation of brandes's main currents of the nineteenth century literature it is but right that the anglo-american world take thoughtful notice of this towering mind as have the people of germany through pastor a barthold's translations and monographs a life writing in english is needed some thirteen years ago i was eyeing the shelves of a book repository when the queer title of an unassuming volume captured my attention it was kierkegaard's the sickness unto death in a swedish translation the main opus of his second or religious period as the famed either or eighteen forty three of his first or psychological ascetic period out of sheer curiosity i read that deep but difficult analysis of religious despair as the sickness unto death strange phraseology novel form profound paradoxes made the task rather tantalizing all i at that time gained was the mysterious sense of a mind of eminent power and of a spirit at home in the intensest toils of the human soul able to pierce beneath all the glittering shams of life to the fundamentals his keen dialectics lyric rhapsodies flashlight visions into the soul depths original labor in the interest of christian personality religious seriousness and triumphant christian love in spite of his irony and superb scorn of the mean all deeply impressed me still i remained a stranger to this strange man so he was not to be read i had laid hold of but one wheel in the complicated engineery of his literature from it alone it were not possible to judge of the wonderful living mechanism in its entirety four years later i became acquainted with the biography by rudin which was read and re-read a work meriting translation into english then began the chronological study of all of kierkegaard's numerous and often so difficult writings and of the parallel portions of his massive diaries and paper scraps the so-called afferlatet papiri his diaries and bescribbled scraps of paper are fallen leaves that make the loam of large discourse much as kant's losi blatter Ricke, and reflectionen aus kant's nachschloss erdmann a repeated perusal of brandes's captivating biography in the full light of kierkegaard's life work convinces me that brandes's central conception of our author falls far short of the truth 
fascinating as his development of certain literary and biographical features unquestionably is an author's own plan for his activity together with the actual literature produced furnishes a surer means of determining his position than an imported interpretation from a philosophic standpoint all out of sympathy with the subject analyzed kierkegaard's and brandes's view of life stand in cutting contrast we need not wonder at the misconstruction of brandes he proceeds from naturalistic presuppositions kierkegaard from the christian revelation what kierkegaard considered the desirable goal of his work i its animus textus that brandes brands as psychological petrifications a perverted inheritance a misguided development of life before the forum of christian revelation kierkegaard's world view whatever its glaring fallacies remains the one consonant with the truth we are as students of christian thought and of literature greatly concerned with the problem of kierkegaard's main purpose in his literature and program of life what was his aim if he had any what his development within the scope of his chief purpose in what manner are the workings of his native genius his life experiences his surroundings and the divinity that shapes our ends reflected in his career in brief what the things that elemented footnote walton and footnote his life and work kierkegaard was more than author he was and wished to be the socratic tutor of his people both by his dialectically arranged manner of life and by his vast literature which step by step proceeded from the lower to the higher and the highest forms of life from the ascetic in kierkegaard's sense to that of a christian witness nor can he be understood unless these two classes of facts be remembered one his two chief mental and personal traits a an unlimited craving to give expression to his thought and imagination and b his restless need of busying his own self as a sort of paradigm of life arising from a consciousness of his great resources of mind and tortured forth by a harassing inherited melancholy two his two spiritual powers a a deep christian religiousness with a keen eye to the ethical and b the sense of a unique mission from god as a christian socrates will not such a nature tend to be excessively selfish he would have been so had not his heart been the servant of a sensitive conscience fostered by ceaseless study of scripture and obedience to its guidance if the traits and powers named be kept in mind the figure of soren kierkegaard will be spared an otherwise unavoidable caricature to which the eminent brandes commits himself in spite of formful words and thoughts for practical purposes kierkegaard's work may be divided into two periods the ascetic beginning with either or in february eighteen forty three when he was twenty nine ending in eighteen forty six and the religious from eighteen forty six to eighteen fifty five a space of only twelve years however for the sake of clearness i would distinguish four periods one the preparatory which includes a literary review of a writing by hans christian andersen the philosophical essay on the concept of irony with constant reference to socrates his doctor's thesis an interesting analysis of philosophical irony quite hegelian in spirit and terminology but in spots prophetic of the coming labors and then a few newspaper articles for kierkegaard used the press from start to finish much as he warred with its flippant spirit leaders of woman suffrage might be interested in hearing that the very first product of kierkegaard's pen was also a defense for the emancipation of the women written when he was twenty-one but alas a piece of irony 
too the ascetic philosophical with occasional religious psychological writings interspersed like an undercurrent in the sea rushing surface word now and then from purely literary viewpoint this is his grand period the style being brilliant profound glittering romantic ironical enigmatical and often lusciously lyrical its principal works are either or eighteen forty three fear and trembling eighteen forty three repetition eighteen forty three chantegals means both repetition and taking back philosophical fragments eighteen forty four the concept of anguish eighteen forty four stages on the path of life eighteen forty five and minor writings religious humorous and polemical the books named are not novels rather concrete experimental psychological treatises in an exquisite literary form rich and beautiful thought expressed in a language dialectical and lyrical and conceived with an indefinable insistent originality his command of language surprises the miniature delicacy facile aptitude for quaint terms of thought and tricksy suggestions talkative familiarity and the power of easily expressing large discourse united to a beautiful northern lyrical richness which in swedish reaches its classical climax all these native traits of the danish language kierkegaard understands loves and embodies in his literature his style cannot be called popular except in a refined sense though in spite of frequent admixture of foreign words and philosophical terms it possesses a peculiarly insistent character the kierkegaard cadence once caught rings on forever there is that strenuous manner not attuned to the eloquence of a landor of which lao says that it never enfeebled itself with undue emphasis the voices crying in the wilderness cannot always maintain the serenity of utterance which churchly good breeding requires for they have the exceptional mission of exceptional souls in exceptional situations in history sometimes he makes difficult reading there are stretches so taxing as the ascent of one of the steep giants in our american rockies but patience is rewarded at last by a glimpse of enrapturing beauty and splendor the ingenious allusions to fairy stories to old sagas and classic myths to popular proverbs to novel and witty situations in the drama of life and in the drama on the stage characteristic of the romantic period in european thought and bell's letters we find in this second stage of authorship nor did it wholly desert him in his later labors then between the ascetic and the succeeding period comes an invaluable philosophical piece the concluding unscientific postscript february eighteen forty six a fearfully difficult production fundamental for the comprehension of kierkegaard however being a retrospect into the finished stage and a prospect into future activity three the religious and religious philosophical period with occasional literary efforts morsels to the ascetes from a now avowedly religious author here are such masterly things as edifying addresses eighteen forty seven the works of love eighteen forty seven christian addresses eighteen forty seven the viewpoint for my author activity posthumously published eighteen fifty nine two ethical religious minor essays eighteen forty nine the sickness unto death eighteen forty nine exercise in christianity eighteen fifty concerning my author activity eighteen fifty one judge for yourselves posthumous eighteen seventy six for self-trial eighteen fifty two and others
the style of this period assumes a deep rich sober and organ-like character in harmony with its religious themes but off and on purely literary writings remind of a former period in brilliancy even a dramatic essay was penned during this stage the crisis and a crisis in the life of an actress a clever treatment of the question whether an actress is at her best at the first admired debut or in her histrionic maturity as always a work crammed with suggestiveness during three years to the close of eighteen fifty four reigned silence except for new editions of former works the warrior awaited his orders from his superior four the ecclesiastical denunciatory period the extreme consequence of his battle for the ideals footnote rudin and footnote beginning with the death of bishop minster eighteen fifty four when his powerful ruthless attack on the official christianity of the state church began in which campaign he succumbed physically memorable is here the pamphlet this shall be said then be it said may eighteen fifty five his ultimatum not to the state church but to the secure impersonal christianity of the official church central however during this time is the series of nine pamphlets called the moment the last part of which he sent forth while on his deathbed the style now has become inflammatory it sounds like the fevered ringing of fire bells fearful invective almost reminding of that of the prophets of israel on the corrupt state church of their ages attack as the formal rush on the batteries of a besieged fortress exclamations interrogations burning sentences and words mark this last stage a man of the people to whom i once read from kierkegaard aptly described the trenchant character of his style by one telling phrase there is a pistol shot in every sentence this inimitably pictures in general both the thought and the style of his always surprising and unfailingly unique writing it applies literally to his last period when every newspaper article and pamphlet he wrote no book during this time is like the rattle of musketry again and again engulfed in the roar of cannon batteries all under the strategic direction of his even now inwardly calm and thoughtful mind kierkegaard was too personalized an intellect ever to become inwardly crazed he had moreover the commendable habit of keeping his most uncompromising and personal polemics in his drawer for months even up to a year before publication in fact he glorified in this self-restraint over against hasty critics of his supposedly hasty writings all through life he played cat and mouse with the critics and only nipped them with his superior wit and irony and his home thrust at conscience when they were about to escape in the noble sense of the word there was a streak of the jacob spirit in him which he organized into his pedagogy true to his own conscience but keeping vital secrets to himself and to his father confessor his thought diary now included in posthumous papers eighteen thirty three to eighteen fifty five a voluminous publication either or his first great and most known work is a landmark in danish literature both as to matter and manner its companion was stages on the path of life at the end of the ascetic period harold hofting of copenhagen says of our author kierkegaard's importance for the danish spiritual life lies in his emphasis upon concentration about the personal life and its needs over against the absorption by imagination and speculation which was distinctive of the romantic age footnote word ach bild september nineteen hundred and two end footnote 
the epoch making either or issued as all his ascetic works with depth of meaning purposely were by a pseudonym victor eremita victor the hermit i e victor namely of himself and hermit the lonely advocate of personality presents two of kierkegaard's so-called stages of life the ascetic and the ethical the third the religious coming in later writings and all three taken together in stages etc either or consists of the ascetic a's and the ethicist b's papers a series of brief luminous flashes from the ascetic soul life open the work the diapsomata which are detached fragments here is the first what is a poet an unhappy being who hides deep agonies in his heart but whose lips are so formed that when the sigh and the cry stream out over them they sound like beautiful music it is with him as with the unhappy ones who in the ox of phalaris were tortured at a slow fire their cry could not reach the tyrant's ears to terrify him to him it sounded as lovely music and men crowd about the bard and say to him sing soon again that is may new sufferings martyr your soul and may your lips be formed as before for the cry would only anguish us but the music is lovely and the critics step forward and say that's right so it must be according to the rules of ascetics well now of course a critic is exactly like a poet only that he does not have the agonies in his heart and the music on the lips you see therefore i would rather be swineherd on the amagerbo and be understood by the swine than the poet and be misunderstood by the critics after these rhapsodical outbursts lyrical witty full of abandon comes a series of ascetic papers of exquisite literary form such as the immediate erotic stages or the erotic in music a treatise on mozart's don juan in which the passionate power in music is described and the renowned and debated diary of the seducer johannes where a cultured gallant day by day records how he systematically fosters as he styles it cordelia for supreme sensualities that shall unite the carnal with the most refined intellectual kierkegaard takes the word ascetic as applied to a type of life in its greek sense of immediate perception in which the soul loses itself in objects not itself of higher or lower order he would convey by it the idea of a care-free or a passionate and plastic surrender to unbounded enjoyment so gained as to leave full freedom for its repetition in the next moment an ideal exhaustion that does not exhaust the personality idea is plainly not in this manner of life these papers the ethical life the balanced mind yet all of a secular order these papers treat of the ascetic validity of marriage the balance between the ascetic and the ethical in the development of personality finally with deep pedagogical significance on our author's part b sends a his ultimatum a sermon by a supposed country pastor in jutland on the edificatory thought that before god we are all in the wrong even the ethical b the last sentence of which and the book is intended as a secret hidden catch on succeeding writings Quote, only that truth which edifies is the truth for you End quote. a thought that makes the question of truth a personal one not merely for imagination or speculation or earth-bound morality but an eternal one three months afterwards a little religious booklet two edifying addresses appeared under his own signature as being an approximative expression of the author's real self 
the two parts of either or are in their style as different as the stages of life portrayed in psychological literary form and have such a wealth of ideas and exuberance of fancy as almost to exhaust the reader's receptivity kierkegaard must be read slowly and with patient thoughtfulness yet his passionate intellect and infective imagination leave one no peace till all be read provided we have sympathy with his burning theme of life personality and in its abiding type christian personality as in the religious period toward this even the ascetic products pedagogically tend i this danish socrates unfolds his whole preparatory activity under the form of a deep and lofty irony as he understands irony Quote, irony is the unity of the ethical passion which in inwardness parenthesis inigit in parenthesis endlessly accentuates its own ego in relation to the ethical demand and of culture which in outwardness endlessly abstracts from its own ego as a finite thing along with other finite things this abstraction affects that no one notices the first the accent of the ego and right therein lies the art and quote concluding unscientific postscript either or never touches on distinctively christian concepts but operates with purely psychological terms the religious ultimate purpose is inhibited in expression though hovering over all as an unseen guiding genius after either or kierkegaard step by step proceeds toward the higher ideas leading on to the christian concepts but always in literary psychological form and always by pseudonyms chosen with deep significance because these writings expressed not his own standpoint they were to give forth truth by the method of indirect impartation compelling the reader to think live act by personal choice not by tradition authority nay not even by the authority of a writer's literary renown indirect impartation being a pedagogical way of fostering a personal existence in fear and trembling the religious is faintly shadowed forth as over against the secularly ethical of b here is presented the collision between the secularly ethical and the absolute exemplified in abraham's sacrifice in repetition also means taking back faith is not habit or resignation but the individual seeks in liberty to gain back the lost temporal and thereby himself from a new standpoint within a new sphere of life rudin philosophical fragments approaches the christian problem asking can truth be learned by socratically awakening the reminiscences or is an historical revelation necessary the absolute paradox can there be given an historical point of departure for our eternal salvation the gigantic masterpiece of thought severest of works the concept of anguish brings an analysis of the psychological presupposition for sin and of the corresponding psychological result of sin by kierkegaard called anguish then in stages on the path of life all three stages the ascetic ethical and religious came in the author's purpose being the picture of a concrete personality the generally religious sphere before going to the directly christian in theory a work so attractive in richness of thought that it well nigh surpasses either or such exquisite portrayal of human love in its main forms will rarely be met with but as in either or kierkegaard did not intend to urge a choice as little as does he do so in his writing 
for the religious stage here psychologically portrayed as always in connection with human love in its many types has yet no christian content but is of an old testament type christian ideas are set forth in the second great period the religious whereby spiritual addresses genuinely deep and lyrically beautiful at times but often dialectical in construction by christian psychological analysis and by theological essays he develops his supreme idea of christendom men's interlegiales in free english paraphrase the personalizing of christianity but space forbids a review of his works in detail only we must not forego the remark that to think his later period less vital than the ascetic means a total misapprehension of the cumulative development toward the great climax of kierkegaard's entire activity his literature and its accompaniment in his life and conduct has architectural unity is dominated by one huge purpose first indirectly suggested with growing intensity the ascetic then profoundly exhibited in ever-riching fullness the religious and finally uncompromisingly insisted on with almost tragical ethic emphasis the polemical in this last phase both the sublime truth and the inherent frailty of his life work find concrete embodiment however as in all things relating to this mysterious personage in so socratically complex a manner as even then in the finale to necessitate a personal conscious choice sure to enrich the earnest student of this closing drama in a great career as the personalizing of christianity surpasses the mere ascetic stage of soul life so does the religious authorship the ascetic as to content though for belletristical enjoyment the ascetic naturally leads he meant then to take hold of men by the vulnerable point pleasure in its lower and in its more refined forms and gradually to foster his time to ever worthier concepts finally to leave it by a free choice no longer born of dead habit with christ in the new testament even before kierkegaard wrote either or and its glittering analysis of johannes the seducer our author had come to personal christian faith as evidence his diary confessions and his main published works he wrote either or with deep consciousness of his responsibility three months afterwards while denmark was astir with either or and its glittering pictures of the ascetic soul life and his fame flared on the heavens he published a serious religious writing named two addresses for edification but now under his own signature a note full of pedagogical meaning by this he intended to convey that the religious was his real self and his ascetic authorship but a gold-banded diamond-studded scabbard to the plain sword of christian truth about to be drawn at the right moment these religious writings in the ascetic period are partly indirect impartation of psychological form though to all purposes devoutly spiritual with a content constantly increasing in spirituality and pedagogically moving on they too toward the christian authorship a danish pastor of our country in a conversation reported to me once called kierkegaard denmark's ezekiel he wrote but like the ancient prophet he acted out truths in indirect socratic form kierkegaard's interpretive and pedagogical conduct that often took on ironic character was part of his act Activity. during the eleven months while writing either or he was constantly in society let loose his fine wit and comic sense promenaded among the gentlemen on the boulevards went to the theatre regularly for a few minutes every evening 
men were heard to say a flippant man that kierkegaard they were thus to be compelled to think of what he said not of him when at home he meditated on scripture and lutheran devotional literature toiled day and night often mercilessly toward his health chronic insomnia attacked him as a result of such strenuousness during the second great period the religious his life was retired quiet in harmony with his heart's deep desire but lest men should now say how religious kierkegaard has become he wrote theatrical criticisms to puzzle and to call forth personal conviction and to martyr superficiality to death for he considered that if a self-conscious conceited reflective generation should be brought to terms receive a shock shaking it at its foundations there was necessary on the part of the champion of saving truth what kierkegaard calls double reflectivity the conscious beneath the self-conscious he must have in experience knowledge of the soul states of that philosophically self-satisfied ascetically pampered morally pharisaical and sentimentally religious age but get beneath it all in an all-surpassing reflectivity double reflectivity as socrates in his day and as christ incomparably among pharisees and sadducees oh and when we remember what depths of tenderness were kierkegaard's of love and of comfort for the sad and stricken which his private life so fully illustrates what a sublime conception was his complex self-consuming pedagogy back of his intricate spine intellect stood his simple christian heart in full control of his tempestuous career he was odd angular mysterious wounding right often yet the one passion of his life never never forgotten was his countrymen's spiritual welfare a man to be loved with a love that covereth a multitude of sins a heart bleeding from the hunter's sting never panted more for refreshing brooks than kierkegaard the ironical dialectical kierkegaard for human and for divine love and love divine all love excelling gave him fortitude for his mission there are four distinct crises in his life chief of these and determining the inner trend and spirit of his career is his conversion at the age of twenty six or twenty seven to so dialectical a nature it meant a painful struggle in his diary notes on sunday april twenty second eighteen thirty eight we read if christ shall enter in to dwell in me it must come about according to the superscription above the gospel of the day in the almanac christ enters in through closed doors kierkegaard had some few years before doubtlessly tried a life of gaiety to what extent may be impossible to learn even from his own confessions as he belongs to that rare class of men who rather accuse than excuse themselves later on diary notes tell of spiritual victory a man with his firm religious convictions could hardly fail at some day to collide with the mummified religiousness of his land and beloved church at that period the second crisis and the most humanly tragical which wounded him for life but in divine providence became the human goad to his authorship especially during the ascetic period was the breaking of his engagement theological readers will here pardon some untheological information on the tenth of september eighteen forty when he was twenty-seven he sought the hand of a maiden his direct opposite she was sunny carefree inexperienced a child it appears in october the next year he broke his vow to her with awful sense of his responsibility amid terrible anguish of heart which trembled on throughout his life like the echo of a sad song that cannot die 
he did this out of love and pity for his beloved fearing the tragical consequences of his deep melancholy inherited from his father Bande suggests on what grounds i know not other physical reasons the man whose entire being cried for love and who had so sensitive a conscience as kierkegaard took this step in christian seriousness search his career and writings as closely as we will never can we say it was done in levity or from coldness for he was deep in love with her and loved her till he died his experience stands as an instructive example of what ethics calls the collision of conflicting duties to spare her some of the violence of the shock he the unfortunate psychologist began amidst nameless ache of heart by psychologically trying to lead her to the conviction that she did not love him meanwhile his own heart was breaking the broken engagement made his genius live act produce as often in life even in the history of some eminent men in the church's annals it became the human incitement to fill out with colossal toil the aching void in a heart parched with a thirst for love he always called himself memory's unhappy lover the suggestive motto of his life in the ascetic writings even in his communion addresses his mind keeps love as a paradigm of life in which he can teach the present-day preacher deep lessons on illustration if i should describe his style briefly i would speak of the lyrical dialectics of kierkegaard this lyrical element so full of wistful beauty with those long lingering cadences in thought and words with that indescribable aching loveliness and profound charm has this self-crushed love to thank for its wakening gossipers in copenhagen vilified him for his step but in his own conscience before god he never for any length of time doubted its moral validity that censure may rest on him for ever entering into the compact will however always seem an irrefutable ethical feeling on the part of even his staunchest admirers for he was of responsible age and she was but a child eleven days before his engagement crisis september twenty nine eighteen forty one he held his disputation for the philosophical doctor's degree then called magister artrium ten days after the crisis he received his doctorate what a rush of events on the third of july the previous year he had taken his theological examination out of piety toward his father's memory rather than from inclination he now intended first to satisfy his author cravings and by ascetic and other publications waken the conscience of his land then to become pastor again and again he is about to take the holy order but a third great crisis comes on it stayed his ordination the times of dissolution in europe since the july revolution eighteen thirty had also influenced denmark a sordid unprincipled spirit ruled its unbridled exponent at this time in denmark was the comic paper corsarin the pirate high or low were at its mercy a jew was editor even kierkegaard was ludicrously caricatured in his doctor's hat the old umbrella bell-shaped prince albert coat one trouser shorter than the other kierkegaard had resented a commendatory but flippant criticism of one of his works he decided to draw the vengeance of the feared corsarin upon himself and break its power this was in eighteen forty two when he was thirty-two years of age he succeeded all copenhagen was by corsarin incited to deride kierkegaard even the street boys pointed at his garment in church they eyed him up and down university students played the farce soren kirk 
half a year later porcerin went out of business kierkegaard had irritated it to exhaust its venom and tyrannic force moreover just now our author was in his authorship ready to leave the ascetic style and to begin the religious christian rather by the war with carcerin he would be a witness to the truth a willing martyr to his holy cause a new side of the dialectical pedagogy in his intricate career what an insight into men's heart he gained during this fearful ordeal we see it reflected in his two leading religious writings the sickness unto death and exercise in christianity and in parallel portions of his diary the final crisis must come it came even more deeply ever more stringently kierkegaard emphasized a personal christian faith and life he did this dogmatically speaking into the extreme in certain ethical features even lapsing into some grave ethical errors as to marriage and on the opus operatum of infant baptism the state church clergy with the galianizing professor martinson in the lead ignored him he called the louder they diplomatically went on and paid as little attention as possible to his piercing outcries though stung to death by them then on the thirtieth of january eighteen fifty four bishop minster died professor martinson in his eulogy called him a serving link in the holy chain of witnesses to the truth from the days of the apostles to our days that a prelate who viewed from the standpoint of a christian cross-bearer had lived so diplomatically avoiding the agonies of a real witness in an age of so pitiable spirituality should be placed in a line with the martyr witnesses called forth all of kierkegaard's vehement resentment in a campaign the like of which denmark perhaps never has experienced he assailed the new primate and the official christianity when the authorities still relentlessly clenched the status quo he sent forth the awful challenge of the pamphlet this must be said then be it said the tragical charge on the batteries of an indifferent conservatism grown secure and forgetful of christian ideals here he calls upon the reader to leave the public worship in its present condition until the new testament christianity's claims be recognized tennyson in his lyric the poet says of freedom and when she spake her words did gather thunder as they ran and so did the activity of kierkegaard nay the clouds at last discharged their lightnings and struck with a deafening clap the gay and unthinking masses and the determined opponents of his principle of spiritual seriousness it has been well said repelled light becomes lightning so with kierkegaard he tried to bring home literary national philosophical and christian truth to most of it the time said no the hegelian philosophical school with its love of massive abstraction scorned his socratic labors for the cause of personality the naive and conceited literary leaders could sympathize little with his rich orchestral-like style and his ironic warfare against the literary fopperies of those transition decades demagogical politicians had little patience with his honest political conservatism and churchmen were forever on the tenterhooks of anxiety from his searching scrutiny of impersonal religiousness all the world is against the great man for a while and so the resistless light of kierkegaard flashed back with scathing energy as always in rejecting they could not escape unknowingly to accept of him even of him whom they naively considered simply as climbing the treadmill of subjectivity kierkegaard himself grew in this storm of principles during his life 
a given age cannot create a genius but it can reinforce him and it can fetch forth all the latent powers in him tease out of its den the lion of personality by lending opportunities for the complex inclinations needs and longings of genius that too often remain hidden in men of a fine mind born in less strenuous conditions the ironical invective which up to eighteen fifty four at minster's death had stood in the controlled service of kierkegaard's warm heart and marvellous intellect from then on became rather pessimistic a direct invective where formerly there was indirect impartation yet thundering forth irresistible truth the marvel is that in his private spiritual life during this stage there seems to have been an inward peace and a trust in the blood and merit of christ as his diary so often evidence in the midst of this supreme crisis he died writing on his very deathbed denmark had stood before the tribunal of one of the most powerful witnesses of the truth known in her history a genuine man a grand though puzzling and uncompromising soul even in all struggles consumed by an unfeigned love for his people and for christ's church the white rose exhales its odorous sweetness as well to the face of the storm as to the still zephyr of evening kierkegaard had lived long enough to develop a fruitful educational movement in the rich sense of the word he had found time to print himself out almost beyond his heart's satisfaction the strategy of his life with its masterful field tactics led on toward a long-prepared closing attack his call to the nation has been heard unmistakably unselfishly time alone would work the rest should he have lived longer and the opposition continued he might have entirely lost his remarkable self-possession which he actually did endanger toward the close the deep inner pedagogy of his work might have wholly yielded to fierce derision out of all control of his loving heart kierkegaard died at the right moment the problems of the kierkegaard career are many and serious from his personal life how after all allowances could so conscientious a christian man break his vow of love there is again the interesting literary question how the romanticist kierkegaard could be in open revolt against romanticism particularly in its literary and philosophical expressions then his intricate but fruitful idea of indirect and direct impartation of truth a christian form of the socratic maiutic comes in for renewed close study as deeply affecting the question of christian personality kierkegaard if ever a man was a pedagogue of christian personality it may be doubted that his superior herein exists in all the range of modern literature but was personality as such his eye mark so professor hofting holds or christian personality was he as it seems in the closing stage actually an ascetic enemy of culture himself a man of such exquisite attainments what shall be thought of the extreme fierceness of his closing agitation which in the series the moment one through nine like a devouring conflagration scorches the mind and heart almost does it indicate a worthy historical estimate of kierkegaard dogmatically to classify him in the genus religious individualism as do martinson footnote ethics and footnote charling volts footnote review april nineteen hundred and five and footnote and others there remains other points but one complex problem will often engage our attention did he write and work by a conscious though not in detail elaborated plan from the outset 
or are brandes and hofting correct in maintaining that his literature is only his own development a sort of nature product of his gradually unfolding genius a few words on this last question there certainly is a deep psychological truth in hofting's words kierkegaard was enough of a psychologist to know that an ascetic and intellectual production in large style cannot be called forth with full consciousness and as a means toward an extraneous end again and again kierkegaard says quote, the whole of my author activity is as i often have said at the same time my own development footnote viewpoint page one hundred and thirteen and footnote but mark at the same time he denies that he from quote, the first moment has had a total view of the whole author activities dialectical structure end quote footnote point of view page fifty five and footnote from such statements brandes then proceeds to deny any definite conscious purpose to his authorship and holds that the religious period began because a religious experience suddenly crossed the ascetic path of his life and authorship kierkegaard absolutely refutes these inferences in the self-biographical the point of view of my authorship written in eighteen forty six just at the end of the ascetic period he solemnly avers that he was a religious author from the beginning and that his works were written with a religious purpose quote, when i began on either or i was as deeply influenced by the religious as i on the whole ever have been End quote he states in eighteen forty six that he three months after either or brought out two edifying addresses under his own signature gives as he also adds a clear hint of the double campaign carried on the ascetic writings of his pseudonyms were the veiled socratic pedagogy on toward a direct emphasis of what he calls his original heart problem Quote, to become a christian End quote. footnote viewpoint page seventy two and footnote to say that he later on in his authorship became the religious man and therefore then a religious author denies his own confessions the inner structure of his personal life and the marvelous unity in the spirit of his literature and in its dialectical architecture considered in its broad outline utterances in the earliest writings convincingly indicate that he had an original secret purpose in mind why throw utter confusion into the kierkegaard activity why empty plain facts of their plain sense that an ill-begotten and ill-applied psychological theory of modern evolution perforce be maintained in honor nay let the actual experiences of this superb personality genius and christian witness remain intact critical theories are anyway a few thousand miles in the rear of the genius wellhausen of genesis and isaiah brandes of kierkegaard in an analytical age let there be a little more of true hero worship ay and of recognition of the divine in history the contribution of kierkegaard to the danish language literature philosophical and religious thought and his startling importance for the awakening and development of personality above all of christian personality make it imperative on all thinking men to aid in making him known also in our america therefore we have called attention to this bright star on the heavens of northern european thought if church historians and theological reviewers would state clearly what kierkegaard's contribution is and be less concerned with the fact that he did not say or do all things their picture of him would be less a caricature of the real man he was no pastor quote, i am without authority end quote, he cries aloud repeatedly 
he was a layman with a voice of prophetic quality the most we have hoped for by this preparatory review has been to approximate a point de vue for the complex character and activity of soren kierkegaard that indeed is far less easy than by a formula simply to register him among religious individualists and then proceed to the very light task of demolishing individualism as his countryman has done in christian ethics the unique danish thinker becomes a subject worthy of study and reflection by all pastors and thinking laymen only when the viewpoint of kierkegaard has been livingly appreciated to imitate him were ruination to learn of him enriches and deepens our vocation as pastors and as christians in the wake of the present deluge of sociological thought will again come a renewed heroic struggle for the cause of individuality when our dane may be one vantage point for orientation the individual will never tolerate to be lost in society much as his full happiness depends on finding his place in the organism of life original geniuses as that humble prince of his tribe the theosophist jacob bomey most famous of cobblers that wonderful gold mine of thought and speculation the independent catholic philosopher franz von bader before him johann georg hamann the magus of the north soren kierkegaard of denmark apostle of christian personality and christian subjectivity and a few like names when intelligently studied exercise a fundamentally culturing and deepening influence on one's inmost nature in them we touch personality at its profoundest depths and in its most amazing originality awakening in our soul a faint anum of the unspeakable divine personality christian personality in pastors and lay folk is to be an eye mark of christian nurture luther remains master of direct presentation of the truth kierkegaard peer of christian indirect impartation by a socratic pedagogy they are two complementary types of mind in the growing complex subtle ratiocinate trend of modern life the bold simplicity of luther's manly directness needs kierkegaard's invincible double reflectivity and keen appreciation of the refined intricacies of mind and life as a healthful corrective times change and we christians must change with them in all things somewhat except in the faith that saves end of soren kierkegaard in his life and literature by adolf halt published in nineteen hundred and six